Welcome to Environmental Law Explored, a podcast series. The podcast of the American Bar Association section of Environment, Energy, and Resources. SEER is a member organization whose mission is to foster the success of a diverse community of environmental, energy, and resources lawyers, advisors, law students, and decision makers, and provide a premier forum for the exchange of ideas and information. This is episode number two in the Microplastics podcast series, which is covering the presence in the environment. If you missed it, the prior episode is Fundamentals and Definitions of Microplastics. We will be covering different media, frequencies, sources, pathways, and life cycles. Microplastics are everywhere, and everywhere you look, you will find them. I don't think there's a place they haven't found them yet. I want to welcome our two presenters today and allow them an opportunity to introduce themselves. We have with us Rachel Henke, Senior Scientist at RU, and Shannon Edmonds, Project Manager at RU. If you will please introduce yourselves. Hi, I'm Rachel Henke. Um, I am a Senior Scientist at RU, and most of my time I spend working on sites doing site investigation and remediation. Um, and one of my specialties is looking into emerging contaminants like PFAS, 1,4-dioxane, and now microplastics. My name is Shannon Edmonds, and I'm a scientist at RU, where I primarily support both our litigation and our ecological services sector. So microplastics is a nice overlap between both the uh, ecosystem services and litigation. Prior to starting here, I completed a master's degree in environmental science at the University of Maryland, where I studied aqu aquatic toxicology. And before that, for undergrad, I studied biology and marine science at Rutgers University. Well, thank you both, Rachel and Shannon, for joining us today. So to kick things off, what are microplastics? When I say microplastics, what do you think of? I think both Shannon and I will fall back to the California definition. Um, in July 2020, they made the job easy for us, and they became the first regulatory body to issue a formal definition of microplastics. And that sets the bound at between one nanometer and 5,000 micrometers. So to help you visualize that can be anywhere from the width of an eraser on a wooden pencil all the way down to something that your eye wouldn't be able to see without the help of a microscope. So it can be a whole lot of things. It's a bunch of different colors, bunch of different um, shapes, sizes, everything under the sun that can come from the breakdown of, of plastic products, or if the plastic product was primarily made to be that small. That is fascinating. And so some of those particles are even so small, they can be found in the air? Yeah, I mean, it's the research, I think air is probably one of the most uninvestigated frontiers for microplastics. Um, I think Shannon will talk a little bit later about, about surface water. And I think that's where the bulk of the studies have taken place but um, everything is plastic. And if you, I guess, go back to um, the 1950s when they were first introduced, they were really useful products. And now um, about 8.3 billion metric tons of virgin plastics have been produced, which is just a mind boggling number. And they're just everywhere and everything, like you said at the beginning. So I guess to, to transition into air, a lot of the things that we're seeing right now is a lot of the fibers that can be shed from clothing. So if you have a, a polyester shirt or any artificial polymer in your clothing material, as you use it, as it's designed, it's gonna be, have different abrasion that takes place throughout your day-to-day -day operations of <laughs> just wearing that clothing. And those can shed and be sort of left and collect as dust throughout your house or your office or wherever you are. Another thing that we're seeing is in, if you do a load of laundry and you dry it afterwards, the air that's in a dryer has 10 times the quantity of microplastics suspended as you would find in a normal room. So that's something that I think was pretty impressive to me. And then we also, are finding that microplastics are really able to be transported via wind from places where they're manufactured or high or areas with 
high population densities to areas where there may not be any human activity at all. So like the top of Mount Everest, I mean, granted, a lot of the hikers are bringing up plastic products there. So that's another source, but your rural areas are getting these um, microplastic impacts. And a lot of that is just from aerial deposition of plastic products or microplastics. So is that something I should be worried about when I'm in my house? Should I be worried about using my dryer or the spray foam in my attic? I think that a lot, you're going to probably hear this on every single podcast episode of the series, is that the research is still super, super preliminary. The toxicological data really isn't there to support a conclusion one way or the other if, if microplastics are harmful. There's some initial data that's coming out that um, sort of suggests that it causes inflammation, and that's never a good thing, but I think I'll I'll save that conversation for a couple episodes from now. Thank you very much, Rachel. So I think Shannon, now are you gonna touch a little bit on what it does in surface water and in sediment? Yes, as Rachel was noting, especially just because these are so ubiquitous and persistent in the environment and can travel really far distances, you end up with essentially two sources to the surface waters. You end up with both products that are manufactured on land and then used on land, but then also products that are used in the water. So think boats and fishing. So they're, they're widely present in, we find them in areas such as the Arctic sea ice, Antarctica, streams in the remote ranges such as Mount Everest, as well as deep ocean trenches. They're present in the ocean in both shallow and deep water. They're on the ocean floor. They are in sediment. They're in the pelagic and in the benthic fauna. And the greatest concentration is probably present in the really deep water, which is still relatively unstudied. A lot of the studies that we do are all focused on surface water and we're, we're capturing all of these floating surface microplastics, but there could be huge concentrations in the deep ocean water that we haven't even studied or have a great understanding of how many are really there. So now I hear all the time about like the great Pacific garbage patch and things like that. That's not really what we're talking about here, is it? This is really much smaller versions of that that, I mean, perhaps they're scattered throughout that garbage patch, but you're, you're talking about something different, right? Yes. So there's essentially everywhere. So the great Pacific garbage patch is one of the places where they really collect. So thermohaline circulation really drives the, the flow of water in the ocean. So you end up with a couple of gyres that really collect a lot of microplastics. So the, the Great Pacific garbage patch that you're mentioning is one of the really big ones. Um, and that has been historically observed for years. Right now, they're saying it's twice the size of Texas uh, in the Pacific Ocean, and it's continuing to grow. But outside of these huge concentration areas, there's it's also in the deep trenches. It's, it's sinking, it's floating, it's coming up on beaches. And all of that is really going to be driven by the plastic itself and how it's weathered, what the density is. So polypropylene and polyethylene and polystyrene all are less dense. So we're finding those in really high concentrations on surface water and on beaches, but some of the other plastics you're more likely to find in the really deep regions and in sediments and inside biota. So are you saying that kind of greater knowledge of that is leading consumers and companies to rethink their use of plastic? Yes. I mean, I think globally, everyone is looking at, we have microplastics present in basically every every contaminant or every compartment of the environment and we're finding it at really big concentrations everywhere we look and even though we don't quite understand the risk we know that right now all these concentrations are just continuing to increase so even if it's only a little bit toxic if we have enough of this stuff present in the environment it's enough to be concerned that these concentrations are going up and maybe we should rethink what we're doing right now and how we're treating our waste and how we can limit the, the increase of, you know, pollute, uh, microplastics to surface water and the environment so that we can control that in the future. So I feel like we've mainly touched on oceans, but this must be a big problem with freshwater streams and lakes and things like that too. Yes. So again, like we said, a lot of the research initially focused on oceans, but there are also really prevalent in lakes and in surface waters, streams and rivers. Estuaries end up sometimes being higher concentrations just because of the circulation patterns, but they're present in all of the Great Lakes and rivers. And it's 
mostly what's going to drive the concentrations and the presence is going to be the presence of people and high, high population density, less so the type of water body. So really it's, it's more, is it more dumping or more runoff or both, or is it coming from the soil? So all of the above. So it's coming from dumping, it's coming from runoff, and then also present in the soil. So a lot of the microplastics are, are weathering both, or bigger plastics are weathering both in soil and in the water. So soil is definitely a big character as well. Rachel, can you tell us more about soil contamination with microplastics? Yeah, definitely. I mean, there's a lot of different sources that can add microplastics to soil. Um, I think one of the most obvious one is just littering. Um, so the mismanagement of waste is, is a big source. Another one is sewage sludge. So when you have any residuals that are collected at a wastewater treatment plant, a lot of times those are sold and used as an agricultural fertilizer. And when that transition happens in that sludge, you get everything that was collect, all the microplastics that sort of settled out um, in that wastewater treatment process. So that can be anything from um, microfibers that were released from your plastic clothing, your polyester shirts. And in the wash cycle, they might be released and then wash out and then get collected at your wastewater treatment plant. You can also have, it's not so much the case in the United States anymore now that they're banned, but the micro beads that used to be in personal care products, those would also collect in that sludge. That sludge can be applied to um, your agricultural fields and then be spread everywhere. And that can be another source to our food chain because the plants can take up those microplastics. And then it, another thing that is a really big source to, to soil is the breakdown of tires. So if you think about how many cars are driving each day all across the world, um, as those tires break down, it's not like they just disappear. All of those tiny little particles get released to the side of the roadway. And then when a big storm comes, they can be collected by runoff and sort of carried to either out to a surface water feature or just remain in the soil. The other thing that I thought was pretty interesting as I'm, I'm not super familiar with the agricultural field, but one thing that's becoming increasingly popular among farmers is the use of mulch film, which is this sheet that can be used to cover your crops and it can help, it modifies soil temperature, it, it limits weed growth, it prevents moisture loss and overall just increases your crop yield. So it really sounds like just a winner winner for everyone. But the problem with it is that due to UV light, it can break down that plastic film or it can be super difficult and labor intensive to pick it up at the end of a growing cycle. But a lot of times it just gets mulched back into the soil and that can be a super big source of microplastics to not only the the shallow surface on top, but a little bit deeper down where you might not expect humans to be directly depositing microplastics. So now this sounds like most of these sources are coming from consumer products. Are you seeing this at the industrial level? Is, are, are, are those agricultural fabrics being used at the industrial level? Is this coming from manufacturing or are those kind of larger uses of plastics better controlling? It can come from a lot of different sources. So you can get a lot of microplastics released from the manufacturing process if you are, I mean, I haven't read a study on it, but I would imagine that during the generation of, of microplastic beads, there's a lot of, maybe not a lot, but there is some waste microplastics that would be emitted because of that. But you do have the the industrial size farms that are using these kind of technologies in order to, to promote their crop yields. So it, it can be everywhere from you drinking out of a plastic water bottle to a big large scale farm. So you're saying like when I buy a water bottle from the store, there might be microplastics in that water I'm drinking? There have been a couple studies that have shown that um, when you do the twisting action to um, remove the cap and sort of break the seal, 
that can remove that can release microplastics into the air. The same thing if you're opening a bag of chips, for example, when you're ripping them open, that can also sort of emit microplastics to the air. So I thought it was pretty interesting that there's some scientists that are releasing guidance on how to best open these packages without having or to minimize the amount of of microplastics that you're emitting and most of the time it's it's using scissors to make a clean cut as opposed to um, ripping something open so so nowadays is there really any place safe from microplastics i mean you would think something like groundwater might be safe right i mean hundreds of feet underground shannon is that something that is still a safe source of drinking water no, so especially with what Rachel said, as far as having these microplastics really ubiquitous and present in, in the soil, that gives them a pathway to then, um, especially as they break down and get smaller, rain can come and they can um, infiltrate and then eventually enter the groundwater table. So this is, this is a bigger problem where you do have shallow groundwater tables, but it's really in a lot of the areas where they've sampled groundwater I think it was in Illinois, uh, 16 out of 17 groundwater samples in aquifers in Illinois all had microplastics, um, most of which were fibers because it's the, the smaller fibers and the smaller microplastics and nanoplastics that can travel further and travel deeper. But soil acts as a conduit for them, microplastics to enter the groundwater system. So it's really gonna depend on the, the type of the soil and how, how bit large the soil pores are on how much or how often this will happen. But it's definitely something that we really don't have a great understanding of and scientists are trying to get more information on, especially because so many, so many of our drinking water sources come from groundwater and it's not something that we're really measuring for or looking for on the front end right now. California is going to start measuring for microplastics in drinking water, um, and we're still waiting for the guidance to come out on that. But other than California, no other state seems to really be looking into this yet. And I'm sure once the guidance comes out and once the lab gets up to speed and we start doing studies, we're going to just continue to find that these are present in our drinking water and, you know, in our houses and coming out of our sinks. And it's it's probably not the worst thing that we're consuming and in general microplastics are pretty inert, but it's still a little bit concerning, especially when we, we don't know, we don't fully understand the fate and effects yet to then know that it's coming from our faucets and no, no real water source is safe. And well, you don't drink a bottle of water because that has microplastics, but also your tap water has microplastics. So it can be concerning. So it seems like decades ago, we converted from lead pipes to copper pipes because we knew lead was bad for us. But then now we've been going from copper to plastic piping, whether it's PVC or PEX or what have you, is should we all go back to copper pipes again? That's a hard question. It ultimately, the more you get into environmental science, you start to see that it's a balance of, of risk and of, you know, what's more in art and what's going to break down differently and what's going to have effects. Oftentimes, and we saw this with PFAS and we saw this with BPA and water bottles, when we find out that something's bad for us and we switch to a, a different uh, solution. A lot of times the solution is slightly different from what we were already doing. So we knew that BPA was bad and now we've gone to, you know, a, a chemical that's essentially one step away from BPA or, or we knew that the really long chain PFAS were bad. So we switched to shorter chain PFAS and we're still generally continuing to use the fluorinated compounds. And so I can't say what the right answer is for the, the future of, of transporting water. It's one of those things that we need to think about products as we manufacture them from a whole life cycle approach and what's gonna happen when they break down. Even things like bioplastics, we we started creating a lot of those thinking that they're more recyclable, they're more eco-friendly, they break down easier, which is good, but then they still create a lot more microplastics that way. So are there plastics nowadays that do break down over time in the, in, in the environment and would that be a preferable source or, or item to use? I mean, yes and no. I would say something that breaks down is probably probably more likely to form microplastics, but it's it's going to depend on what the ultimate size it breaks down to or how that behaves with living things. You know, at this point right now, we're still talking about microplastics, but the next big thing is probably going to be nanoplastics, which are what the microplastics break it down into. So as the audience is thinking about this and thinking through what we've talked about, what would you say is the one thing that they should take away from this discussion today? I think for me, it would be stay tuned. Um, there's a ton of 
new data that's coming out. I mean, even the number of studies that have come, been released in the last two years is, is tremendous. We are gonna see a lot more data. We're gonna know a heck of a lot more as um, more studies get released, as California approves their methodology. Definitely stay interested in this topic and keep tuned in. Shannon, do you have any closing thoughts? Um, yeah, I would kind of echo what Rachel said. Ultimately, I think that we're still at the stage right now where we don't quite know what we don't know. And, and every avenue we look, we're finding more that these are really present, but we haven't started doing a lot of studies on the interactions yet. It's more still, still defining the presence and size range. And I think once we're better at doing that and we can start looking at interactions of microplastics with living things and both humans and organisms, which I know is going to come up in the next couple episodes. I think future research on that is really going to drive where this goes. Well, it is certainly a fascinating topic. And thank you both, Rachel and Shannon, for sharing your thoughts with us today. And thank you to the ABA for hosting. The next episode will go into more detail about sampling methods and analytical techniques. So be sure to tune in. Thank you. We hope you enjoyed today's episode. To learn more about our section, please visit our website at www.americanbar.org slash Please check where you found us for future episodes. Thank you for listening.